It's, it's, instead of telling you about my, the discussions we had at lunch, let me focus uh, and let me, let me go on to the story I've actually prepared. Uh, it was a very good lunch. Um, uh, and so I, my name's uh, Les Carr. I'm from the Web Science Institute at the University of Southampton um, in the UK. And uh, you'll be hearing more of this uh, this evening from uh, uh, Wendy Hall, who'll be giving uh, a talk. But uh, just to say that the Web Science Institute tries to bring together um, uh, people from multiple disciplines across the university um, to analyze the, the, the impact of the web to, uh, on society and to look at the way that it's being successful and not being successful, the challenges that we face as governments would like to switch it off, as companies would like to change big international um, uh, uh, powerful uh, financial forces would like to change the way in which it operates to suit them better. Um, if we can understand the web better, then we can make sure that no one does anything too stupid, we hope. Um, I run a doctoral training centre, which is trying to develop with the students the right kinds of methods uh, to help us to use the web to recreate an accurate picture of the world, and it's a world that includes the web as part of it. So, what is the web? Um, this is one of the... Uh, uh, I guess one of the basic things we have, we have to think about, we've, we've asked ourselves, what is a mind? I've chosen the much simpler option, perhaps, what is the web? Um, and if you ask the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, uh, where the Tim Berners-Lee established to uh, govern the, the emerging standards of the emerging web, then um, when you pick through the documents, you see that they think that the web is an abstract information space. It's uh, a place that you can imagine that has information in it somehow. Um, and it, it, it defines information resources. And for each of those information resources, you associate them with a special address, which we call a URL or a URI. Uh, and, uh, and for each of those information resources, once you know its special address, uh, you can obtain a representation of that in a particular well-understood standard format, such as HTML or RDF or PDF or something. Uh, and the way that you turn an address into a representation of the information that should be uh, at that address is by asking the internet. You ask a special set of questions to the internet um, uh, using a, a protocol, uh, a, a computer language called HTTP, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Um, and, so, and so that is very, very simple. It's three simple things um, that, that define the whole of what we now think of as the web. They are the, the foundation. Uh, of the web. And so um, what I want to talk to you about is how it's not just that technical foundation that is important, but it's, it's how um, human activity, the activity of minds, the intention of minds, the agendas of human, uh, of human beings have been really important in the web, uh, and how we, have to, um, how we have to factor those in in order to understand what we mean by a web. So, a uh, bit of a pop quiz to start off with. How many of you recognize what that is? Anyone from Southampton, keep quiet. Yes? That is, that is CERN, um, and the yellow, uh, you can see Lake Geneva up here. Some mountains give it away, perhaps, uh, but not as much as the large yellow circle that's been painted on there, which is the, the track of the Large Hadron Collider. So you actually got both questions right in one. Thank you very much. Um, and um, this, is, this is the home uh, of the, uh, the European Research Centre for Nuclear Physics. Um, and it's where many of the basic questions about the universe are answered. Do you remember? <laughs> these kinds of headlines that we had in, in 2008. 
Um, uh, this is from a particularly, um, well, a, a particular news uh, art, uh, newspaper in, in the UK. If you don't come from the UK, you've never had cause to read it, just thank your lucky stars. Um, not that we have lucky, oh, well, never mind. Um, so, but in fact, no, this was an, an example of Betridge's Law. Anyone know what Betridge's Law is? It's a law to do with journalism. That if you start a headline, um, if you start a headline with a question, the answer is always no, but it's revealed somewhere later on in the article. Um, so, better, if answer would better is just law. No, thank goodness we, had, we didn't have that. And so, when we switched on the Large Hadron Collider, there wasn't, uh, we didn't generate any black holes which then went on to um, destroy the Earth, to, to suck up all the matter in the planet and to destroy our civilization. But what they'd missed in these headlines was the fact that something had already escaped from CERN. Um, and in 1989, a piece of technology that was designed by uh, Tim Berners-Lee to assist physics researchers in interchanging information. You have to rewind to 1989, 1988, 87, 86 to remember what computing was like in those days. We didn't all have PCs. There were lots, um, when people came together to work on uh, physics experiments at, at CERN, they brought with them lots of different kinds of servers which, which didn't interoperate very well and they had all of their, all of their an, an analysis, all of their data analysis going on in, in different computational environments which couldn't speak to each other. And so uh, the web at the time was a, a, just a way to pull these things together. It was um, it was a, a bright idea that Tim had, and it was as his boss wrote at the time on the top of the memo that, um, that described what he wanted to create. It was uh, vague but exciting. Um, and so they created this piece of technology for physicists to use to, to help them exchange information across their incompatible systems um, and to... Uh, to be able to work together, to collaborate better together. And it took off in CERN um, and then sort of travelled with these itinerant researchers back to their home universities, kind of took off in the physics departments there and then the computer science departments, the universities took hold of them, other research companies took hold of them. Uh, um, and then it just went into general circulation amongst, um, amongst all sorts of uh, companies, and we, we, it, it, it escaped into the general population, as it were. Anyway, so I've, I've presented this, this thing of the web as escaping from a, you know, what is a, uh, an underground re uh, uh, nuclear bunker, effectively, um, uh, which, which has gone on to massively impact the, the rest of the world. And the interesting thing about the web is that um, it is the physicist's web that we have got. It's the high-energy physicist's web that, that we've worked with. And because it started off in one lab for addressing the needs of one set of people, it's a piece of technology. It's a computer program that someone wrote. And the person who wrote it didn't sit down and say, well, what would we need to do to be able to do online banking or to have you know, safe communications between people to preserve the, you know, intellectual property and to, to this, that, and the other. He just sat down and thought, what, what will uh, suffice for my needs? And because of this rapid inflation, so it's just like the physicists you know, trying to find out the secrets of the Big Bang and CERN, the, the, the genesis of the web is it kind of has the same feel about it. The universe, we're told, started off incredib at uh, incredibly small dimensions, very much packed together. Everything that was is, is, is there. And then all of a sudden, it went, uh, underwent a period of rapid in inflation, rapid growth, so that now the universe we see, if we look in that direction, it looks pretty much the same as it looks in that direction. And these things are you know, sort of tens of billions of light years apart from each other. And you have incredible consistency throughout the web. All the conditions of its creation were carried out through this, in, were, were driven into this, in this huge expansion. And so 
the requirements of high energy physicists, which broadly speaking are the requirements of the academy, were driven out into this piece of technology, which then is now used to, to connect, you know, roughly speaking, you know, every person in the world with every other person in the world. That's an exaggeration, but you know what I mean. Um, and what are the properties of the academy? What are, what are nuclear physicists like? Well, apparently they're very well funded. They take huge amounts of money from, uh, from government coffers, uh, and then they all get together at these places like CERN and spend it. And when these people get together, they're not saying, oh, I'm from the French team, we've discovered a little thing, and we, we're going to set up a bidding war for this information. So you Americans, um, you British, you Brazilians, you're going to have, the person who pays us the most will get this part of the jigsaw. No, so they are, they are um, they're academics, they're researchers, they're very well funded, and their livelihood is not um, based on trying to sell their intellectual property, trying to sell the discoveries that they make. And so they share things together, and because they're all funded together, they, they're pulling in the same direction. Um, they're trying to... Uh, they're all trying to discover the same thing, so it's in their interests to make, uh, to make their work available within that context and to, um, to help each other and to collaborate with each other. In particular, it's not like the real world, so they're not trying to sell their bits of the discovery to anybody else. They're also not worried, for example, that people are going to come in and steal all the large hadrons. So security isn't a big issue for them, you know. So, so these things, these concerns are just absent from this web, from this technology that go, then goes out and invades the rest of the world. The academic, the high energy physicists web. But of course, you know, so society is diverse and um, different parts of society have different aims and objectives. We, the academy exists, we hope to to create new knowledge and to transmit it to the rest of society to, uh, in order to um, improve society, we hope. We are, and we all depend on standing on the shoulders of giants and you know, sort of building on each other's research. Uh, that's our raison d'etre. Whereas commerce, their aim is to make and trade goods. So they're not trying to give away their, their, their things because they don't have government giving them lots of money. Now, I appreciate that I'm talking perhaps from a UK perspective. It may be that in Canada or the US, the government doesn't give so much money or doesn't give it in the same way. Um, and it may be that your institutions are constituted somewhat differently. But broadly speaking, you know, commerce is trying, to, is trying to trade goods, whereas um, the academy is trying to do something different. The press needs to investigate and report news, the media, the police, the judiciary, government, the armed forces, the security, service, the security services. Let's not open that particular can of worms at the moment. So, so the web that we have is the web that, that um, accords to the needs of one particular part of society. But it's not the only web that we could have ended up with. And in particular, there have be, there's been well over a century of efforts to try and create something that looks like a web, something that is a global, i.e. non-local, um, mechanism to exchange information. Uh, and that, so for example, I've created a table here. Um, I've started off with Reuters. So Reuters in the 1850s were tr at a time when still the fastest way of exchanging information was uh, a man on a horseback, you know, sort of getting, getting things between two places. Reuters were trying to set up in business uh, to exchange um, uh, uh, trading information about stocks and shares between the, the, the Paris stock market and the London stock market. And so they, they used the technology of the day to try and get a competitive edge that was homing pigeons. And so the whole, uh, the whole Reuters empire is built on the use of, uh, of homing pigeons. I have no idea whether that is, that's cruel in any way. I, have, I may be told from the back. 
Um, but, uh, and in fact, what I've, what I've discovered recently is that the French government tried to ban the use of homing pigeons for, for exactly this, for, uh, for these kinds of purposes shortly after Reuters started. But um, they then went on to use another newly developed technology, uh, which was the electric telegraph. And so, you know, as that, that started to be laid down, um, their, their business expanded. There are, there are other technologies, and I've, I've listed them through here. The, so the, one, the web that won was the high-energy physics web. It came from the universities, the academy. Um, but we've had other attempts at the web uh, at, at doing things. Uh, so some of these were based, uh, uh, were, were, um, done, were created by government. So you might look at Minitel as an example of that in, in France, uh, of allowing people to communicate. Uh, it was very business-oriented. Um, you might look at um, a system like the Memex, uh, which I'll come on to in a minute, which came out of the military and the needs of the military. There was uh, a, a system called, where are we? I can't see, I've got the wrong glasses on. Uh, Xanadu, uh, from Hollywood, uh, made by Ted, uh, proposed by Ted Nelson uh, in the 1960s. I think he's finally got a working version of it, a working implementation. But that, that puts not information at the centre, but authors at the centre. Um, Ted Nelson uh, was the, is the son of a famous Hollywood actress, uh, considers himself to be a, a director first and foremost, a film director, and so he sees the world in terms of people who are people who are trying to create and share information. And it's the people rather than the information that is the most most important. So if we have a look at um, Paul Otley, who was a documentarian, I think he described himself as. He was responsible for a number of innovations. He introduced the three uh, by five inch library card, piece of paper, a format for paper as an invention to Europe. Um, but he, he, one of the things that he created was a, uh, a system called the Mundaneum, which was effectively a very large index. The, the, the concept of indexing, the concept of encyclopedias was very prominent at the time. Um, and he created with his library cards um, an index to uh, a million documents and images. It was located at a place in, uh, at a building in Brussels, uh, 15 million index cards to it, and it was such that people could use the new invention of the telephone. They could phone up, they could say, I have a query about a particular topic. Uh, I want to know about hedgehogs. Uh, sorry, the first thing that came to mind. And the person on the other end of the phone says, certainly, sir, hang on a moment. And they'd go and look up in the index. Um, and, you know, these racks and racks of papers. If you're old enough, library, you know, university libraries used to have these things in. Um, and so they'll be quite familiar to you. Then they'd come back and they'd say, yes, sir, I found um, 50 um, uh, answers to your query. Would you like any more? And so this is feeling a bit like Google. You know, click next page. Oh, hang on a sec. Let me get, and get it. Um, come back, and then they'd read out to you all the places where you could find this information, what it said about it. So, so in, 19, in the 19, around about 1920s, someone had created Google, right? Without the use of, uh, without the use of the internet, without the use of computers even. But, you know, we say in computer science, there is nothing new under the sun, and there, gen there genuinely isn't. In fact, this was better than Google because the, um, uh, the librarians that he used, when he phoned up and made an inquiry, would write on the bottom of the card um, who had made the inquiry. And so they, uh, when you phoned up, they could say, oh, yes, uh, quite a lot of people have been asking about it. And they could tell you who else was interested in this subject. So it was like a social network being embedded onto Google in the 1920s. So... Um, Oh, yes, there's a picture of a library card if you haven't seen one before. So H.G. Wells, as well, uh, right at the beginning of the war, he was particularly worried about the role of the university in society. 
And um, he proposed something called the world brain. We've already heard about a world brain. But again, built on a new technology, built on the technology of the... Um, uh, oh, my mind's gone blank. What's that called? Uh, the microfilm. Uh, microfilm, microfiche. Uh, in which you, know, you could take a photo of every page of every journal, reduce it down... Uh, and, uh, and provide that for, re for researchers. And in doing that, you could have a repository of all the, of all the knowledge in the world. And he proposed this at the um, 1937, one end of the Second World War. The other end of the Second World War, uh, Vannevar Bush, who noticed as the chief research director of the, uh, of the war effort in America... Um, he noticed a, a real problem amongst his scientists was that they were getting increasingly siloed and that they would know an increasing amount about their field but not be able to relate it to the scientists in the laboratories uh, near them. And so he proposed a system called the Memex, which was just like the world brain uh, in that it was built on microfilm uh, and involved photographing all of the journals and all of the books. But he proposed a system of levers and pulleys that would allow you to stamp a mark on the beginning of one page and then create a uh, move to the next, to another page, another document that you're interested in, stamp another mark on, and create a link between those two. All right? So he talked in terms of links and having a link from here to here and here to here and here to here and being able to follow those links as a trail. And so in 19, uh, when was it, 1945, he invented hypertext once again without the benefit of computers or the, uh, or the internet. It was, never invent it was never implemented. And so we could fast forward a bit. Vint Cerf, the father of the internet, creates, creates this substrate for the web. Uh, the network of computers and routers and cables and clients and servers. In fact, that's just a network, and have lots of those all networked together, and you get an internetwork, all capable of um, receiving and sending messages, like FTP and other. So this has became the available, the available technology that, combined with um, Tim Berners-Lee's uh, invention consisting of URLs, H HTTP, and HTML became the web. But, as I said, it was a long time coming, and there were lots of different alternatives that have, have been offered. In fact, there have been alternatives proposed since. One of the first alternatives um, was a, a piece of technology built on, like the web, which tried to eliminate 404 errors. And so uh, uh, Hyper-G from the University of Graz in, in Austria um, had a, a, an awful lot of engineering and development in it to make sure that everything on, the, on their version of the web would remain consistent and you would never have any 404 errors. Turns out that is from an engineering point of view, very, very complex and expensive. You know, it's a very complex and expensive thing to do and unwieldy. And one of, the, one of the things that was brilliant about Tim's idea was just making it complex enough and getting rid of all of, basically most of the research that had been done in hypertext systems in the previous 20 years. Uh, and so that is, this is the web that we've ended up with. So, uh, just um, some more audience interaction. What is the web that you use? What, what, are the, what, are the most, what is the most important website to you as, a, as an individual? Gmail. Pardon? Gmail. Gmail. Okay. Google. Gmail, Google. Any other advances on Gmail and Google? BBC News. BBC News. Hurrah. Uh, Tumblr, okay. Tumblr, pictures, videos, text. Is this is this your t is this your Tumblr? No, the other one. Ah, the other one. Uh, okay, right. Yes. Google Scholar. Google Scholar, okay. Another version of Google. 
Watching TV, yes? Okay, great. Google Maps. We're having quite a few Google products here. Have we got? I, I ought to say other search engines do exist. You might not be able to name them, of course. But. Who, who else had a? Someone say Twitter. Oh, the woman in red. Yes. GitHub. GitHub for for developing source code. Yes. Okay. So. Kickstarter. Kickstarter. YouTube. Absolutely. So the interesting thing, and, and, and so, uh, so the second question is, why, why are you, what do you get out of using these things? Why, why are you using them? Yeah, go on. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so it's so it's easy. Yeah. Uh, because we we would like to interact with other people. Yeah. And so so which which website are you talking about particularly? Which service? YouTube. YouTube. So it's so it's through videos you're interacting with. Yeah. And learning, right? Okay. Did I say? Oh yes, okay. Right. Okay. So you can so you can do things faster. What kind? What what kind of things? What? Anything that we've just. Okay. One more. Go on. It's cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there is a there's, it's a variety of things that people are doing here, but it's interesting the fact that all, I think everything that you said wasn't in the web, the, the original web. It's not a part of it. It's something that, that that came after. So searching for things on Google. No one mentioned Wikipedia. Looking up facts on Wikipedia. Sharing photos on Flickr. Blogging. Watching catch up TV. Updating Facebook status on, on your smartphone. Um, and you know, the reason that Tim's web didn't do that was for many of these things it was impossible. You know, sort of we have the web has developed as technology has developed. You know, we keep forgetting what it was like before. Well, you said today, they won't believe you. But you know, it's it's very true. You know, we forget. What, what our lives used to be like. So that was one of the first commercial digital, ca uh, first uh, consumer digital cameras available. The Apple Quick Take cost about $700 uh, in 1994. Was released just about the time the, the web started, uh, and this whole this whole f photography online imaging uh, was may well be one of the reasons the, this web took off. Uh, search first search engines, Alta Vista, 1996. Um, Wi-Fi. You know, we used to do the web by sitting at you know sort of big, you know, big computers on our desk, which had you know about three foot deep monitors. Remember the, remember those, and um, uh, and we were stuck there. So, you know, sort of Wi-Fi, you know, sort of triggered this. Um, the mobile, the use of mobiles and laptops. Broadband meant that you could do things that you could do at work at home. Uh, in, in the UK, it wasn't really till the year 2000 that we started to see broadband kick off, and there were lots of problems with the web that were down to it being dialed up. And of course, the smartphone, which has changed, changed our experience of the web in, in so many ways, didn't come along till 2007. And so it's important to remember that the web wasn't a static thing that was parachuted into um, our lives, but it was... Uh, it's an, it's an ongoing active, act of creation. You know, companies are creating things, but we are creating things. We are changing the way that we use this information resource. And so the web is a network of information being created by a network of individuals, people who already have families that want, they want to, to talk to, people who are... Um, who, who are in international networks because they're at universities, people who, who, are at comp who are working, have trading links, and so on and so on. So the web wasn't just invented by Tim Berners-Lee. 
Um, it's being invented by all of us as we gradually adopt these tools and new tools arrive and we start to use them. You know, it's, it was, wasn't predictable that this was going to be successful when the iPhone came out. You know, it was, people poo-pooed it. They said, oh, it's too slow, it doesn't do anything. Why would you, why would you, want, uh, why would you want to have all of this stuff? Um, and so we shape a lot of this stuff. This is a diagram that Tim created to express what he thought about as the, the, the magic, the thing that was unknown about developing and creating the web. The fact that someone has an idea over in the right-hand side. Uh, let me see if I can work the laser. Someone has an idea, um, and they're in a, you know, in a startup company or, or, or at home in a garage. Um, they, they design the technology, they try to factor in the social, what they know of the social constraints or the social ideas, uh, and they build it in the lab, in this micro thing. And then when they, 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 did, they test it with a few people or perhaps hundreds of people, and then when they think they're ready with a product, they release it into the wild uh, and they see what happens. Uh, and then um, they see, does it take off? And if it takes off, does it take off in the way that they thought it, they thought it would? So you get something, uh, and then, oh, if things go wrong, there are the things people are, are not doing right, or it raises problems, then they have to use their creativity to, to come up and change the idea, and then redo it in the lab, release it again, and keep going around this circle. So you end up with some, something like a search engine gets created, gets released, it works wonderfully, you know, sort of, People are, people are very happy with it. And then you, you end up with uh, something like search engine op optimization, and the whole world is gaming the search engine to try and, uh, with spam, to try and get all their links up to the top, so you have to, you have to respond to that and go, go back again. But you don't really know what's going to happen until you jump, until you jump this, uh, this barrier. You put it out into the wild. Uh, as uh, in, in, a, in a way, uh, and then you just look back and say, oh my word, what's happening? I don't, don't quite understand this. And so one of our aims is to try and understand the web, not just as a technology, but there's this kind of fusion, this union, this hybrid between technology and sociology, the socio-technical. It's, it's people, it's uh, human systems, it's institutions interacting with technology. And so the web is really a collection of activities, and it, and it grew by co-opting different activities. So to start off with, we just had websites and pages and home pages that you could visit. And then gradually, we developed these ideas that you know, the, the home pages of a shop would actually show you their catalog. And then you'd actually be able to, to buy things or, or order things on it, and you'd still have to phone up and make the payment yourself over the phone. Remember those days? Um, and then gradually, you could, um, you could actually pay for things with your credit cards online. And so, and so the whole experience developed. But while online shopping was developing, online banking was developing. And they were both affecting each other. And so the visa, whole P visa payment system uh, moving over uh, online and supporting online transactions. So we need to be able to look at these things and, and, of course, the reason we've got online shopping is it wasn't just the fact that, that, that the web enabled shopping. No, it, it, um, it, shopping was something we've always been doing, but we just, we kind of demanded, there was this demand that we should, should be able to do it on this piece of convenient technology because it would be so much faster and cheaper and more convenient and we wouldn't get stuck in the traffic jams on Saturday when we were going out trying to, trying to buy things. So, we're, uh, so one of the things we've been trying to do is to, to, to look at the, the emergence of these things as, as human society and technology um, try to come together. So we've been, been using some uh, theories, uh, some ideas from sociology, from actor network theory, or ANT, uh, uh, by Bruno Latour, a uh, famous exponent of this. Um, where you look at all of the actors in a network, you try to understand their, the role that they contribute in the development 
of this new activity. So a web activity like open access or, uh, or open data, open government data. Um, look at all the players, look at the interactions between them, try to understand what's been going on, look at how the technologies evolve, how the, the, the web technologies evolve, the standards evolve, what happens to the governance, um, so that we can understand what is going on uh, better. Um, so, one of the th so there are three, I think, um, uh, components to, to the way we try to look at this. Um, so, a, a socio-technical system like the web, composed of the social and the technical, sometimes we think of it as a social machine, you'll hear more of that later on in the, in the, in the week, um, is a heterogeneous network. And by heterogeneous, we don't just mean, oh, it's all technologies, a network of technologies, or it's all a network of people and, and, and organizations. It's a network of all of these things. It's the, it's the organizations who establish agendas and goals, and then other people relate to that, and they, they make the technologies, they, they have to force the technologies to, um, to um, support those goals and those ends, or the technologies fight back, as it were. The technologies won't support those things, and the agendas and the, and the behavior change. So we look at the way all of these things um, try to come together uh, by looking at, at the relationships uh, between uh, something. So, so here we've got, uh, where did I put that thing again? Um, lots of things make up the web. We've got social networking, web shopping, search engines, so on. Oh, here's open government data. So a practice that uh, we've particularly studied. And open government data itself consists of, um, we have to consider the, pub, uh, the public sector, uh, civil society, developers. We have to consider organizations, uh, citizens, researchers, and the, the relationships between them. So once you've got these, this network, then, you, then that's fine. But what happens is the network tries to, tries to make itself stable, tries to say, this is going to be a thing, and it will work. And how are we going to do that? So you have this process uh, of translation, where translation is just a word for there are different ways that you start from an idea, and you end up with an activity with lots of people, lots of things, uh, joining in, which is self-sustaining uh, and works. So, ha so uh, for example, one of the issues that we've looked at recently is this, this idea of open government data. Of, uh, on the, we the web allows governments to release data to make their practices more transparent, um, to allow innovation, to create new businesses who can use this, mash up this data and use it in different ways. How did that get out from being someone's pipe dream into actually um, all the auth local authorities and governments in a particular country acting on that and doing the right things, using the right technology, making the, uh, making the, r the right decisions? And so you have different stages in this. Often, so you start off with a, a stage of um, problematization where someone says, you know, there's a, real, there's a problem here, and I'm the, I'm the person to solve this. So you've all got to do what I say. Um, you have, then the next stage is um, interestment, um, which is uh, the, the, the person saying, you, 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 you're going to be part of this. You come in and you, you, we need your skills, we need your organization to, to be part of this. This will be great if you join in. Um, Enrollment is where people, you know, people and organizations and technologies um, you know, sort of negotiate about the different roles that they're going to play uh, and whether or not they're going to allow the boss to be boss. And then uh, mobilization is when the whole thing starts to work. So it's a, this is from uh, actor network theory. We've used it to describe uh, different ways that web activities actually um, come, to, uh, come to fruition. Then what happens is... On the web, which is, which is quite unusual, because the web um, is, 
it's not just an information environment that happens over there. It's the way that we communicate. It's the way that we network socially. It's the way that it's the thing that mediates, you know, our shopping and all sorts of things. We find that once once we've once you cre once you change something in the web, once you make something happen, then that changes all the other networks, all the other activities around feel the impact, and so they start to change. And in response, it means you have to change. So every, because everything, basically, things in society are all networked together, then particularly on the web, um, one change uh, has, has lots of knock-on effects. So I'm going to look at something particularly simple as an example now um, of that. Wikipedia. Wikipedia is the sixth most popular website at the moment in the whole world. Um, behind some of the really big, it's a, you know, it's a not-for-profit web, uh, web activity, and it's, uh, the, the websites that are bigger than it are all, you know, sort of really big commercial concerns. Um, and so I want to try and show an example of, of how this, this works. So you might think, well, Wikipedia, someone just created a website and people joined it, and that's all there is about it. What are you going on about? Well, in fact, um, before Wikipedia existed, there was, another, uh, there was another encyclopedia entirely called Newpedia, and that was commercial. And it was, it was, an it was a very much a traditional idea of a, an encyclopedia, um, experts were asked to write articles, and then it was peer-reviewed by other experts, and then they put that up on the, on the website, uh, and the way that it was all going to be supported was through um, advertising. And so there are a number of, uh, there are a number of players in this network. Uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Wales was one of them, who you know as the guy in charge of Wikipedia. There were, there were a few others. There were develops, developers who created the, the website, the Noop Code, as it was called. Uh, and there was an organization called BOMIS that was basically funding this. This was the, this was the um, parent organization. And some, at some point, someone had the brilliant idea because they said, oh, the problem with this is it's very slow. We haven't got enough articles. I know. What we can do is we can ask people uh, to suggest articles. They can contribute their own articles, and then we can put them into the pool for the, um, for the, uh, for the Newpedia experts to look at and to turn into proper articles. Um, <coughs> and so there was, there was lots of discussion about this. Everyone agreed this was a good idea, but no one wanted to have these nasty amateur articles um, on the same website. So they had to create a new... Uh, website to, to put all these articles on. Um, and what happened was after, after about three years, this is kind of 2001 to 2003, the uh, Noop, uh, Noopedia had managed to get something like 23 articles up, and there were 20,000 uh, articles on this other one. Right, I'm being given a... I'm being give, so... So something changed. So what happened was the web changed things. You had, this, you had this network of actors. The web changed things. And so instead of Newpedia being at the center of things, Wikipedia, wikipedia.org came to be at the center of things with a whole new community of people. You had all of these uh, amateur editors. You had um, um, still Jimmy Wales, but other people left because it was... Um, uh, uh, because the business relationships were changing, it's fine to look at that. But, but a new technology emerges, uh, and that is the, uh, the, the Wikipedia software. Um, and, but there's another phase in here. What happens is that Wikipedia software and the whole approach becomes so popular that other people adopt it, the community grows, and you get the Wikimedia Foundation appearing, and wikipedia.org just becomes one of those projects. Um, so, uh, basically speaking, um, there, are many, there are many projects. The foundation becomes the key, and you still have the article editors and these, these amateurs who were co-opted through, uh, through the web. So, sorry, I'm, I've radically overestimated 
the, the number of uh, slides that I could fit in here. So, so, the, so that's just the thing. So the, we've tried to apply this kind of analysis to all sorts of things to find out. Because people say things like, Twitter, no one expected that. That was a complete surprise. How can we predict whether something like Twitter will, be, will, will work or not? And the answer is, well, it, it didn't come out of the blue. People were already doing SMS. It turns out people like communicating and doing social networking. There are, there are all sorts of ways of analyzing the bigger things about this community of people, this community of brains that make up the web. So the web was three big ideas from one man in a piece of technology that escaped that was unfinished enough to allow lots of people to, to project their own activities, their own business activities, their own personal wants and needs onto this technology and over the last 20 years to turn it into something which is entirely unlike what it was originally but in some ways exactly the same thing. Although we are still a bit worried about what this open technology and sharing everything with, with, every, with everyone means. And that's what we're trying to do in the Web Science Institute, trying to understand these things. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I've gone on.